church family and welcome back to another one of our online Sundays. We've been doing a four-week preaching series looking at the life of David and it's not the whole life of David, we've only had four weeks on it, but we started on week one looking at when he was anointed to become king over all Israel by the prophet Samuel and we're going to conclude the series today as he becomes king over all Israel and that is found in 2 Samuel chapter 5. 
all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel, and you shall become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. So this is the day we've been heading towards. And depending on how you viewed this series, you might be thinking, oh, this has taken so long. Could I be more bored? And there are... And linked with that, it might be a phrase that you've uttered, or it might be a phrase that you've heard uttered, where someone asks the question, are we nearly there yet? Now, David has been waiting for this day for quite some time. We know that he was king over uh, Judah for seven and a half years, and he was king over all Israel for, for 30 years, or 33 years rather. But it took about 15 years to get to this point. He was probably around 15 years old when he was first anointed. And so 15 years approximately from that day to him becoming king. And he could have, I wonder if during that time he ever prayed the prayer that was the equivalent of us asking, are we nearly there yet? You see, the truth is that we, we kind of live in an instant world and we like things to happen immediately. There were times when our children were younger, when if we're going to go on a long car journey, we wanted to mitigate this thought of, are we nearly there yet? And so a snack box was made for each of the children. And the idea was they were going to be in control of the snack box and they could manage their snacks from when we left to when we arrived. And as soon as we were back out of the driveway, as soon as the front wheels hit the tarmac and the opening seconds of what was going to be an hours long journey, you'd hear the little unclipping of the snack box to, to make a start on it. And we kind of like that. We like things to be instant and to be immediate. When I order books now, I don't have to wait weeks or months for them to arrive. I've got a Kindle app on my, on my tablet and I, I buy them and moments later, they've appeared in my library. Uh, there is a, a company that I used to work for and the, we got a new boss in place and he came in and he looked at the, the spares that we were holding. These were spares to repair you know, pumps and air conditioners and things. And he reduced our stock right the way down. And he said, we just don't need to tie up that much money in spares. We can, if we need something, we can just order it. And it'll be here same day, maybe tomorrow. And so there was, a, there was an instantaneousness to what was required. Now, this was obviously, uh, if there were supply chain issues, this could be an issue. But by and large, it, it worked fine for us. And so we are used to living in this world where, where things happen instantly, where we get uh, instant results, where we get instant feedback. It, it all just happens so fast. But back in the day, they didn't expect to have these instant things happening. In fact, they viewed things in a long-term sort of way. And I don't necessarily mean long-term in ter terms of days or weeks or months or even years, but sometimes they would view them in terms of decades and hundreds of years or or recognizing that the plan of God was going to be worked out in this world ultimately we see this in in Hebrews chapter 11 and in Ch Hebrews chapter 11 there were a number of folk who uh, were faithful they followed God and they anticipated that something would happen but they didn't get to experience it in their lifetime and so people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and Sarah and Enoch and Abel, this was what was written about them. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. This was amazing. This was long-term thinking, a long-term understanding that it's easy for us to miss out on because sometimes we look around and we think things should happen here and they should happen now. We don't understand always why, uh, I don't know, we don't understand why those with dubious morality seem to succeed. We don't understand why my own faithfulness does not have the outcomes that I would like now. Why does evil still have a foothold in this world now? I don't know the answers to these questions and many others, but it doesn't change the reality of what ultimately will be. 
God has made promises. And remember what I said last week and the week before? That the strength of the promise is based on the one who makes the promise. We have been told that those who are found in Jesus will go to be with him when we die. We have been told that Jesus is coming back again. One of those is going to be my experience. And this is a big deal. We can say that Jesus has not come back again yet. But there will be a yet on the end of that sentence. About 2024 or so years ago, people could have made, this, made the statement that Jesus has not come yet. And that would have been true. But there was going to be a day. And it was a day that, that we'll be celebrating in, in a week's time for a few weeks. Where the yet gets dropped off the sentence. Because we know that Jesus did come. He was born of a virgin. The night sky was lit up with the angelic voice. Herod did cause the crying and grieving of many as he sought to find and kill Jesus. Now, I don't know if he's going to come back tomorrow or even if he's going to come back in my lifetime. But we have been promised that he is coming back again. It doesn't matter if he comes back in my lifetime. The truth is I will be meeting with him at some point. It means that what we do here and now really matters. It matters on the decisions that we make. David gets called something here, which is not just king. You may recall that the kingship of Israel was not to be the same as other kings of other nations. Israel was never meant to have a king. They were meant to be relying on God. They weren't meant to have a standing army. They were meant to rely on God. They didn't need to have foreign policy. God was going to be dealing with all of these things for them. But they decided that they wanted a, wanted a king and God relents and allows them to have a king. But over here he introduces another aspect of the expectation of what a king should be in Israel. And that is shepherd. You will shepherd my people. And David would have got this. He was a shepherd. He understands shepherding in a way that us city folk would struggle to. But for him, this was an easy concept. This was uh, in his wheelhouse. This was in his toolkit. This was uh, in his, the experiences that he had was that of shepherd. He had skills in that area. And we, we've got skills in certain areas. And, and if it was in our area of expertise, then, then as soon as that was mentioned, there are certain things that would come flooding back to mind. We would know, we would understand, we would be in the environment which we understand most clearly. I was reading a book called Matthew Said, and he was interviewing Michael Stick, who was the, uh, you might recall, he won Wimbledon one year. And in the interview, the, the journalists were talking. Now, Matthew Said was a table tennis player, and he represented Britain uh, in table tennis in the Olympic Games. And what happened was the uh, challenge went out, and Michael Stick said, I will be able to serve a ball, and it's not just that you won't be able to return it in court, you won't be able to get a racket on it. Matthew Said fancied his chances because he was a table tennis player. And even if he might not be able to return the ball in, he could still get something on it because his reflexes were actually pretty good, as they need to be to be a table tennis player. As the story goes, Michael went and he did all the warm-up things that he needed to do, and then Matthew Said was waiting, and eventually it was time for, for Michael Stiff to, to serve the ball. And when he served the ball, Matthew Said couldn't get a racket on it. And the reason why he couldn't get a racket on it was that he couldn't work out he couldn't understand what he was seeing he didn't have the muscle memory of what tennis players who've been playing tennis for years and years and years and years know they understand the way a ball gets bounced and the how the person winds up to take the serve and the the little nuances and they take all this information their their brain um, translates it for them under agassi was great at this he tells a story of how he how he used to mitigate the the serve of boris becker he worked at that Boris Becker had a tell. And he didn't tell Boris Becker about this until after they had retired. Boris Becker apparently used to go home and tell his wife at the time. He said, it's like he knows where I'm going to serve the ball. And what would happen was Boris Becker would stick his tongue out. And he would either stick his tongue out in the middle of his, um, in the middle of his mouth, in which case the serve was probably going you know, straight down the middle or towards the body, or he would stick it out a little bit uh, off to the side, and then under, I guess, he knew that the ball was going to go out wide. So in one sense, he had an idea where it was going. But that was only because this was his environment. He could read the signs and understand all of what was going on. And David would have been like this with shepherding. He had shepherding muscle memory. And so it's no surprise to us that David penned probably the best known of all the Psalms, Psalm 23. 
And we could maybe not recite the whole psalm verbatim, but it's one of those psalms that as soon as someone starts it, you know it. It's kind of like a piece of music and you hear the first few notes being played. You think, I know that song. And so that's what happens with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, the psalm itself is a wonderful piece of poetry speaking to the experiences of David, but also not just the experiences of David, but how he relates to God, the things that God does for him. And it sets it out as shepherd and in other terms of what God is like. But we read about how he leads us to green pastures and beside quiet waters and how our souls are refreshed as he guides us along not easy paths, but the right paths. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, it wasn't the mountain of death or the plains of death, but the valley of the shadow of death. It's a, who wants to travel in that valley? It doesn't sound like a good place to go at all. Yet even here, that has the shadow of death looming ominously over it, a place which is the lowest point. Even here, I will fear no evil. And it's no small thing. I was at the AGM of the Northern Association the other night, and in it I was speaking to a, a pastor I'd not met before. He's a retired pastor. He's retired to Auckland. He's not from Auckland. And, but he's been around churches for, for ages. He used to serve on the national executive. And I was talking to him, and I don't know how we got into the conversation, but I told him that I thought that pastors were far too sensitive, that we were, uh, we were too precious about ourselves and our theology, that we took ourselves far too seriously, that we should laugh at ourselves more, that we should, um, each of us recognize that we are here just for a moment in time, that we're having our go now, but there's going to be a time when it's someone else's go, and then we need to uh, allow that person time and space to have that go. To recognize that we are but a vapor in the wind. That we are here for a moment and then we are gone. I said to him, I recognize that even though I'm in a church and we've been here for 12 years and you know, we'll be here for some time yet. And it's a good relationship with the church. But I know there's a time when, when I, I won't be the pastor of this local church anymore. And uh, yeah, days, weeks, months, and then some years will pass. And, and fewer and fewer people will know me or even remember me. We're here and then we're gone. And then he paused for a moment and he, he said, he said, this is true. And then he th said, he asked me if I'd recently had a near death experience. Now, I must have been waxing lyrical about these existential thoughts that may have given a perception of depth that we all know I don't have. But he thought that I had had this near death experience. Now, I don't want to. Uh, make this sort of heavier than it needs to be. But I recognize that we are here for a short period of time. It has been said that there's only two things which are certain, and that's death and taxes. And I pay my taxes, which means I've only got one more certain thing left in my life. I hope it is many years from now, and I hope there's going to be amazing experiences between now and then. But it's when we hear words like this where we think actually things come into sharper focus. We all face it. And David is able to comfort himself with these words that he is in the presence of God and God is with him. And that's great, but what about me? I received this text the other day from Sue, who is the manager of our early charter center. She writes, Hi James, please could you drop by with, a, with passport and driving license and sign the police check form. You expire next month. Oh, no. I started taking my pulse. I booked a doctor's appointment, as you can imagine, because I don't want to expire next month. You can imagine my relief a few days later when I got another text from Sue, which simply reads, Hi, James, I got your year wrong. You don't expire until 2026. Ha! Huh. I got another couple of years, at least before I expire. But Spurgeon points out that even though it's the shadow of the valley of death, the shadow of a dog cannot bite. The shadow of a sword cannot kill. The shadow of death cannot destroy us. Notably, David recognized that under the shepherd's leading, he may walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This isn't a destination or a dwelling place. This is the, and reminder that death is the greatest of opponents, the one that seems most final, the one that is inevitable, but has in Jesus been reallocated from being a destination to being something that we walk through. Even if we just pause and look at the words of the opening line, the Lord is my shepherd. 
And we can place different emphasis on different words. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is the word for Jehovah. This is God himself. The role of shepherd would normally have been done by hirelings or at or the very least in a family. That's why when we first meet David, we don't uh, meet him before the brothers. The brothers all parade before Samuel in this parade of a would-be king. But David, it's the youngest, who is out, who is tending the sheep. Yet God adopts this position for each one of us. That Jehovah himself has said that he will be our shepherd. Voice says the great God of the universe has stooped to take just such care of you and me. Rabbi Joseph Bar Hamna says there is not a more contemptible office than that of shepherd, but God disdaineth not to feed his flock, to guide, to govern, to defend them, to handle and heal them, to tend and take care of them. This is amazing news. And it's amazing. We see this in the person of Jesus. He didn't remain in heaven, but came to us as one of us. He stooped down and he didn't appear as a man. He appeared first as a baby. The Lord is my shepherd. Sheep are objects of property. They're not wild animals. And it's the owner who, uh, who owns them. And, is, um, and sheep are often bought with great price. And it's good to know, as David did, that we belong to the Lord. There is a noble tone in the, in the confidence about the sentence. It's not an if or a but or even a I hope so, but is my shepherd. This is a statement of truth in this moment. It's not a, a will be true moment. It is true now, here, immediately. The Lord is my shepherd. It's personal in that he is my shepherd. Spurgeon writes, the Lord is the shepherd of the world at large and leadeth forth the multitude as his flock. But the Lord is my shepherd. If he be shepherd to no one else, he is shepherd to me. He cares for me, watches over me, preserves me. The Lord is my shepherd. One of the descriptors of Jesus is that he is the good shepherd. Not a good shepherd amongst other shepherds, but he makes this unique claim about himself. We know that sheep are not inherently bright. They need help for all sorts of reasons. They are not designed to fight off a predator. They don't have any poison or speed or flying ability or fangs or claws. They aren't waterproof. All the sort of things you might want if you're a potential prey. They do not know how to find the best grass. They could not read the weather. They couldn't work out where the grass was green and watered. And they didn't recognize that these same places were probably at risk of flash flooding. They needed to be brought in at night. In short, they needed a shepherd. The sheep need a shepherd and similarly so do we. We need someone who can guide us and protect us and, to ensure, that we have, and ensure that we have food. And in Jesus, the good shepherd, we have this for us. Jesus goes on in John 10 to say that he lays down his life for his sheep. His life has been given for ours. And the implication is huge. It means that we can know what David wrote all those years ago. That this best known of Psalms was something that we yearn for, which is true in Jesus. These promises are for us. These promises that, that goodness and love will follow us. In the psalm, when they talk about goodness and love following, this is a, a pursuit. Uh, this is almost a harassment which is taking place. And it's quite a pursuit to be continually pursued by God, by his goodness and by his love, continually after us. We recognize that the best, uh, the, the mo the best moments of kingship of David are but a poor example of what we have in Jesus. And here is the last thought of the shepherd motif as it relates to you and me. For this, we need to view ourselves as sheep. I know we prefer to be something different, a mountain lion or a bear or a wolf. But the truth is sheep need a shepherd and we need Jesus. In Jesus, we have the one called the good shepherd. And so today, if you don't yet know Jesus, then can I encourage you to speak to someone? Speak to you can give us a call at the office if you're watching this online. Speak to one of your friends that you know that you know maybe from from a church, and ask them, and they will happily make the introduction to Jesus, our good shepherd. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning, and we thank you for being the good shepherd, that you have fulfilled 
all that we needed and so much more. That you paid the price so that we don't have to. That you continue to shepherd us, to guide us, to lead us, to protect us. We thank you that you've sent your Holy Spirit to continue to draw us to yourself and help us to be ever more in the likeness of the people that you're calling us to be, to love God and to love others. For we pray this in your precious name.